Hey, I'm Nate with Christ Church Montevideo. Our community Bible study groups have been going through the Gospel of John since March. Now we're taking a few weeks to join them in the heart of the book, chapters 10 through 15 or so, when the intensity is growing and this time that Jesus keeps mentioning is approaching. Because if you read through the Gospel that this disciple John wrote, you will notice that time is a pretty major theme. Jesus seems so calculated about timing while he was on earth. And John records Jesus constantly saying peculiar things like, my time has not yet come, or a time is coming, but has already come. And now in these chapters, he starts to communicate in words and actions that now it's time. Now he decides it's time to get less cautious around those who want to kill me, it's time to get more direct about revealing who I am. And it's time to start getting explicit about predicting my death, resurrection, ascension into heaven, and the sending of the Holy Spirit. We will cover these in the following weeks. But last week in John 10, Jesus made it very clear multiple times that he was equating himself with God himself in Jerusalem of all places, the headquarters of his enemies. The religious leaders tried to kill him, but he narrowly escaped across the Jordan River, and that is where we find him at the beginning of our chapter today, chapter 11. But he is being asked to go back to Jerusalem. Lazarus, Mary, and Martha lived in Bethany, which was a Jerusalem suburb. Now, throughout this passage, Jesus is very clear about his purpose which fits right in with the purpose statement at the beginning and end of this gospel. To show who he is so that people would believe, so that we might have life. To show who he is so that people would believe, so that we might have life. Jesus said this Lazarus situation was so that the glory of God's Son would be displayed. And that's what he said about the blind man that he healed back in chapter 9. And in the opening verses of this book, John says that since Jesus came to live among us, God putting on human flesh, we have now seen his glory. No one has ever seen God, but now we have. He's made himself known. Later in chapter 11, Jesus added that this situation was so that you may believe. And the one who believes in me will live even though they die. Which is what John concludes his book saying, This is written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. So Jesus' purpose here is to show who he is so that people would believe so that they would have life. So who is Jesus? Well, we see two huge statements here about who he is. Jesus, when he told Martha, Your brother will rise again, she said, yeah, I know. I believe the scriptures that promise that one day there will be a resurrection at the end of time. And Jesus responded powerfully. No, listen, I am the resurrection and I am the life. I'm not just a teacher of end times resurrection theology. It's not just that I have the ability to resurrect and give life. I am the resurrection and life. Life doesn't exist without me. I am the source of all life, and I uniquely have control over all life. So Jesus is somehow literally life, and similarly throughout this chapter, we learn that Jesus is love. Again, not that he is super loving. He is love itself. Love does not exist without him. He is the source. This same John made that as explicit as possible in a letter he wrote. So the main idea is that Jesus' purpose is to show who he is, and he is life, and he is love. In the different scenes of this story, he shows that in three ways. First, Jesus showed his life and love by waiting. By waiting. This is probably the most peculiar. The messenger came to Jesus saying, Your friend who you love is sick. And confusingly, the text says Jesus loved Lazarus and his sisters, so he stayed where he was two more days. Extremely puzzling. 
maybe even very frustrating. While it doesn't seem possible, somehow this waiting is clearly connected with his love. Now, Jesus shows he is life and love as the master of time. His timing is perfect and purposeful. And his big picture here was to do something even greater than anyone expected, and by doing that, cause many to believe and have new life. But you and I know the end of this story. It's clear that Jesus knew the end of the story, but the people emotionally affected by this did not. But it makes me think of baking cookies as a kid with my mom. I remember seeing the raw dough looking so good and wanting to eat it all right there and then. Now, I think sometimes I was allowed to taste the raw dough, but most times I remember distinctly that my mom said, not yet, not yet. The egg is raw and it's not really good for you. But if I were to say, no, I want it right now, she would say, I know this seems like it would be the best thing ever right now, but I'm holding the recipe in my hand with the time it's supposed to be in the oven. And I know that if we wait, it's going to be so much better. Plus, then there will be enough for everyone to enjoy. Making me wait was out of love. And God is holding the plans and the timing in his hands. And his thoughts are beyond ours. And he knows when waiting will be way better than right now. Now, interestingly, in the time and culture that Jesus lived in, they would bury a person who had died within 24 hours because the heat would quickly deteriorate the body. And in that rush, and without our modern capabilities of detecting when someone has officially died, there were occasional incidents when someone's breathing seemed to have stopped, their heart stopped, they put them in a coffin, and in the funeral procession, the people heard banging coming from within the coffin. This person was somehow resuscitated or revived. And you may have heard that in the Middle Ages, some people were buried with a rope tied to a bell above their grave, just in case. These days, we are well aware of this possibility of the defibrillator sometimes being able to restart the heart after someone has died. Well, for this reason, there was a Jewish superstition at the time that has been documented in various writings that supposedly the spirit of a person would hover over the body for three days, hoping to re-enter. But then after the third day, when it saw that the process of decomposition had started, it would finally move on for good. Now, when Jesus got to the tomb, we are told that Lazarus has been dead now for four days keeps mentioning that. Even Martha said, no, let's not open the grave. It's been four days. The decomposition is sure to have started. See, in Jesus' mastery of his audience and his perfect timing, his resurrecting Lazarus couldn't have been written off as, oh, well, that was impressive and rare, but technically it's not impossible for someone to come back to consciousness. The spirit is still hovering around after all. But after four days, Lazarus was dead, dead. By this, Jesus made a decisive statement about his control over life. There was no denying it or minimizing it. The people would have to make a decision one way or another, either decisively believe in Jesus or decisively reject him. There was no middle ground. And now I want to notice in each of these sections how Jesus' people respond to him in their situation. And I notice that each time they questioned Jesus, they doubted him and they expressed that to him. But then they said, at the end of the day, we still trust you. Here in the first section, his disciples questioned Jesus, but ultimately trusted him. They said, we shouldn't get close to Jerusalem again. It's certain death. But okay, we will go, even if it means dying with you. Having a relationship with Jesus means it's okay and important to express to him your questions and doubts, how you really feel. But then to tell him, even now, I trust you. He will show you that he has life and love by waiting with you. And next, Jesus showed his life and love by weeping. By weeping. 
The shortest verse in the New Testament is one of the most powerful. Jesus wept. We might wonder, if he's life and he knows what he's going to do in a few seconds, why is he crying? Well, here in our translations, it usually says he was deeply moved. Really, the Greek word means anger or rage. And it says he was troubled, which is the word for agitated or stirred up. This was such a strong emotional response. And it's clear that God in human flesh, who is life, hates death. What he calls the last enemy that he came to earth to defeat. And when he looks around at its effects on the people he loves and cares for deeply, it makes him weep tears of anger. Clearly, his heart breaks to see his children dealing with the oppressive power of death. And when the people saw him cry, they said, wow, look at that love. Have you ever cried tears of anger or even anger mixed with sadness? Have you ever seen someone cause pain to someone you care about? Now, I don't know about you, but when someone hurts me, it's one thing. But if someone does or says something to hurt my wife or a family member or a friend, man, it's a whole different level. My natural emotion is anger that wells up inside of me and I want to jump to their defense and protect them from what harms them. Maybe this is a small version of what Jesus felt here. And again, notice Martha questioned Jesus but ultimately trusted him. She said, if only you had been here. But even now, I know you're able to do anything, and I trust in the promises of God for my future. It's okay. It's important to express your questions and doubts to Jesus, how you're really feeling. But then to tell him, even now, I trust you. He will show you he is life and love by weeping with you. And lastly, Jesus showed his life and love by working. He showed his life and love by acting. He brought Lazarus back from the dead. Remember, his disciples didn't even want him to come to this suburb of Jerusalem. And doing this type of thing at this base of operations for his enemies was literally a death sentence for Jesus. So we can think, how could Jesus say he loved Lazarus and then wait two more days but by going at all, and by doing this attention-grabbing miracle, Jesus really gave his life for his friend. Life for Lazarus meant death for Jesus. And Jesus said just a little later, greater love has no one than this, that he lay down his life for his friends. The good shepherd lays his life down for his sheep. And again, notice Martha questioned Jesus, but ultimately trusted him. We shouldn't open the grave, she said, but okay, do what he says. It's okay, it's important to express your questions and doubts to Jesus, how you really feel, and then to tell him, even now I trust you. And he will show you his life and love by working in your life. Now, sometimes, like in this story, we get a glimpse into the why of God, why he doesn't do what we want him to do when we want him to do it. Sometimes we get to see the payoff, the happy result that God brought out of a terrible situation. But a lot of times, we don't get that. We don't see that. Now, we don't have to understand all of his ways and whys, but this story illustrates that even when we can't see his reasons, we have reason to trust that he has one and that it is good. Because he has revealed who he is to us. He's revealed his big picture plans and thoughts to us so that we can trust him. God takes bad situations and works something ultimately good out of them for those who love him. Sure enough, what Jesus did for Lazarus, he ultimately did for all of us. Life for us meant death for Jesus. And throughout all of history to this point, God has been lovingly waiting, bearing the injustice and death of the world until the perfect time. 
God had wept in anger and sadness throughout history at the injustice and death and all its effects on the world he loves. Then, at just the right time, he performed the greatest work of love to conquer death and give new life. Jesus, the eternal God-man, laid down his life so that we could have life even though we die. So to end in this final section of John 11, we see it's time. It's time for people to make a decision. We see that the resurrection of Lazarus demanded a response. Either decisively believe in Jesus or decisively reject him. And the text says that many saw and believed just like Jesus wanted. Still others with the same evidence, decisively chose to make his execution happen soon. Now, this event is the foreshadowing of the resurrection of Jesus. The resurrection of Jesus demands a response one way or another. There's no middle ground, believe, reject. And I think it's time for us to consider that event, the evidence for it, and make our move. Because Jesus wants us to know him truly and completely so that we can have true and complete life and true and complete love. Because he is life and love. And when we choose to follow him no matter what, like his friends here, we can enjoy a relationship of genuine openness and trust, knowing that Jesus loves to be close to those who are brokenhearted. He is with us.